Thoth Hermes podcast. Welcome to the world of the Western esoteric tradition. Hello, friends and listeners. Welcome to episode 21 of season 8 of the Thoth Hermes podcast. And this is Sunday, July 24th, 2022. And I can tell you, it's really hot here near Vienna. Well, I think it is hot across all of Europe. My name is Rudolf and I am your host. And if you hear this fan in the background, no, it's not a fan I'm running for myself. It's just a computer that turns up its fans so much because it gets so hot while recording here. Well, anyway, that's what it is. It's summertime here on the Northern Hemisphere and that's how it should be. Maybe it's a bit hotter than it should be, but that's life. Let's not always be unhappy with things that belong to life, right? Which doesn't mean we shouldn't think about what's happening on the world, but that's another matter. And why am I all saying all of this? Because, well, somehow the subject of today's episode, Nocturnal Art, is subtitled, um, fits some way also we hear about that also in the interview into the state of the world anyway it's richard gavin who returns here as my guest this time as non-fiction writer that he is we had him here in episode nine of season five that was just after that long break i took in 2020 we had him as uh, as a fiction writer but now we had him as a have him as a non-fiction writer and that's quite extraordinary to have somebody like that on both of his capacities right and it's again a great talk you're gonna see but why i'm saying all this i'm not in the intro yes yet first of all i would like to welcome you welcome to this new episode well episode 21 i said 24 episodes are in this season and well three more to go until we have then a new restart with season nine at the end of August. Right, so Richard Gavin will be our guest and I welcome you all who have returned to this show, who have been here before. It's great to have you back. Thank you also to all of you who support this show, to all the patrons. It's also great to have you and it's necessary to have you. And this goes, of course, to all the others who have not yet become uh, supporters here. Um, well, please do become patrons of this show. Go to the patreon.com site, look for the Thos Hermes podcast, or much easier, go on the Thos Hermes website, thoshermes.com, T H O T H E R M E S dot com, and click on that Patreon button or on the donation button if you prefer. We are really happy if you do because we need your support. Well, thanks for this and while you're at the website, go and listen to all the other old episodes. You have 133 other episodes other than the one we here have here today. And with each single episode, you can go on the page of the, of the episode, the show notes, you have links, you have information, you have photo, you have the music descriptions there. It's really full of information, that website. Do not miss it out. I mean, I know most of you, and that's great, listen on those podcast apps. And I'm happy to say that we are around all over the place on those podcast apps. Thanks also to you, the listeners, because you demanded it. And there we are. Five years and four months it's now that we are here. And um, every week we get more listeners. And that's really great. I'm really grateful. Uh, thank you to you all for being with us. Uh, while you're on the website, yes, there's another matter you can do. You can also send me feedback. Please do. Please do send me feedback and please do also send me your music. If you are a musician, if you are a performing artist, send me your music. Let me know what you 
uh, are doing, what you're producing, and I will be happy to play your music on the show, right? Okay, talking about music, it's about time that we now start with the first piece of music. And, and well, it is very dark music here today. Nocturnal art, the book is called The Infernal Mask, we are going to talk about. I thought, well, there is such a vast amount of dark ambient music out there, really good dark ambient music, and I should play for this episode dark ambient music. So I hope you do like the idea. The titles, well, they are also, they are also, the track titles are also a bit dark. We start with a track where all the three tracks are by a group called Cryo Chamber. Cryo Chamber who produce kind of cinematic sound, dark ambient sound. And the first is from their CD called um, Void Stasis, Void Stasis, and the track is called Ruins. So the tone and the color are set. We hear cryo chamber with Ruins. Enjoy. <laughs> Thank you. 
Ruins from the CD Void Stasis by Cryo Chamber. And Cryo Chamber are going also to be our musicians of today for the next two tracks. Same style of music. I hope you like it. Richard Gavin is going to be here with us today. As I said, Nocturnal Art is the subtitle of this show. And, well, I am going to read to you, as often I do, a little, little part of his new great book that was released just a couple of weeks ago by Theon Publishing, a really beautiful volume, The Infernal Mask. And it's a kind of sequel to The Benighted Past that he has already published with Theon Publishing a few years ago. We get all about that in a moment. But um, let me read you a little, well, two little paragraphs from the first chapter of this book. The chapter is sub sub subtitled The Cauldron and the Thunderbolt. Um, and before that, I would like to read to you a little excerpt from Jacob Böhme's Aurora from 1612 which Richard Gavin put as an intro on the very first page of his book. So let's start with Jacob Böhme, and then I'll go into the first chapter of The Infernal Mask. Here we go. Lo, I tell thee a mystery. It is already time that the bridegroom crowneth his bride. Guess where beeth that crown. Towards midnight the north, for amidst the sharp astringent quality, the light becomes clear there and shining. But whence comes the bridegroom? Out of the midday, where the heat giveth birth to the light, and goeth towards the north. What did they do toward midday? They are fallen asleep in the heat, but the great tempest shall rouse them, and beneath this many shall be frightened to death. The present work explores the interplay between primordial darkness and infernal fire. It is the dynamic tension between these two fierce elements that creates the sublime frisson. For the initiate, this frisson is experienced in a manner that is at once visionary and visceral. For while it is perceived through the soul, it is also palpably affecting the nerves and the skin. The frisson is also intimately connected to untamed and forlorn sights. Its shiver pulsates through nature giving birth to a unique Gothic atmosphere in any area that has been sanctioned for the expression and exploration of the nocturnal art. Nocturnal art, that's the title of today's show, and I am now not going to hold us longer back from meeting Richard Gavin. Here comes the interview. It is always a special honor and pleasure when somebody returns as a guest here on to the Thoughts Hermes podcast. And it's my pleasure here today to have somebody. Actually, you, Richard, Richard Gavin, who is my guest here today, you were here with me at some point when I did that recording. I remember it was also summer. I believe it was August two years ago. And then I did that recording and then I took suddenly my break in podcasting and that poor interview lay there for half a year and you were, you were nice enough to say, no, that's okay. I can still release it after six months. <laughs> but this time this is not going to happen. Richard, it's, I'm glad to have you back here, here on the show. Great oh, it's a you. pleasure to be back. Thank you for the, the return invitation. Well, of course. And um, well, last time, Richard, we spoke about the Richard Gavin that most readers of uh, weird fiction or dark fiction or whatever we, we, we defined it back then in two years ago. Uh, um, no. And today it's the nonfiction writer, Richard Gavin, who is my guest here today. And not that this were a surprise, but it's 
quite a rare thing that a very well-known fiction writer would also be um, present in the field of nonfiction writing, right? I would think so, especially for, you know, writings of esotericism. I, I, I know that there are probably a few out there, but it is definitely, which is a strange thing. I mean, I always find that I, I kind of occupy that, that liminal space between the two because often it's writers are either of, of one or the other. Um, yeah. but I've, I find a great deal of, of, you know, pleasure and, and gratification from, from doing both. So I'm, I, you know, I'm happy to, to be back to talk about uh, some of the nonfiction work today. Great. And um, well, the immediate reason for you being here now is that you have just released a few weeks ago a new book with Theon publishing The Infernal Mask. Uh, I have it here in hands. And um, the first thing that always strikes you when you have a book by Theon publishing and some other uh, publishers of that of that uh, vein um, is the the quality of the book, I mean, just the, the object, you know, the, you touch Absolutely. it, you, before you even open it, you have something in hand that you love. <laughs> and I, I completely agree. They amazing. always do such a magnificent job. Absolutely. And it's, yeah, but was, they always, always somehow manage to surpass my expectations when they, when they reveal the, the production of what the book's actually going to look like. So it's, it's just, it's a pleasure working with them. And it's, it's always such an honor to see my work presented in, in such a vessel. Absolutely. In fact, the book, The Infernal Mask, uh, we have here is kind of, would you call it a sequel to The Benighted Past, your first one with them? It, it is. Yeah, it's definitely it definitely builds upon the, the foundation of the Benighted Path. Uh, the Benighted yeah. Path came out in uh, 2015 and it was really a sort of a broader foundation that that we laid. And it was interesting the way that that book came about, because at that time I had been in correspondence with David Beth of, of Theon Publishing for a few years. I think even before Theon started, he and I had, had exchanged letters and and talked about different different topics and david was one of the people that introduced me to uh, ludwig klages the biocentric philosopher right. of mm -hmm. you know the part of the cosmic circle in munich that were that were uh, pretty prominent in in the mid early to mid uh, 20th century mm -hmm. and a lot of klages's uh, terms and philosophies really resonated with me and one of the one of the key ones that David talked about in his book, Voodoo Gnosis, was this, the concept of night consciousness as opposed to a kind of more solar, logical uh, day consciousness. And that always, you know, that, that felt both new and familiar at, at once to me. It was something where it was wonderful to see it articulated so concretely and thoroughly the way that uh, Clagus did it and through David's uh, presentation of those those terms and at the same time it was also something that was you know familiar to me I, I i felt i knew precisely that of which he spoke and it was around 2013 i believe that i had been contemplating exploring night consciousness through some kind of nonfiction work and through just one of those amazing synchronicities that that just happen in life out of the blue i i received an email from david beth saying i was thinking I, it would be great to have a book that explores night consciousness come out through theon and i was thinking you would be a great person to write it so at that point i took that as a portent and you know immediately accepted and then set about trying to really figure out how i was going to articulate something that I always sort of felt on an intuitive level, really going back to, to childhood. And I know we, in the first interview that you and I mm. did together, we, we talked a little bit about that. So just attempting to capture and convey something that, um, in a way that was clear, relatable, and still evoked a bit of that, the sense of the mystery and the numinous that is so central to that whole concept was definitely a challenge, but it was extremely rewarding. And one of the things that was great is that when I did produce The Benighted Path and it did reach readers, it was very gratifying to hear from people um, that they felt that similar resonance and, and almost like a vindication. Because I think there tends to be with, with 
darker imagery or or with you know more sinister type of imagery um there tends to either be people who revel in that for a kind of contrarian sake a, a sort of uh, rebellion against uh, a more whether it's a mainstream religion or other forms of spiritual practice but there's also a belief that these are these types of images and experiences are things that you just basically have to overcome to, in order to become enlightened. And to me, the, the central core of both the benighted path and the infernal mask is that in, in, in my view and in my experience, the terror and, and beauty both dwell at the heart of the sacred. I, I do not believe that they are, um, I believe it's an inseparable feeling. Um, and because of that, that was the, that was really the, the kind of ethos that I wanted to explore with, with the work and was able to then present that in, in a fairly broad form with the benighted path and having, having presented that was then able to refine it more and have a little bit of a narrower, but deeper focus with the infernal mask. We're going to go a bit more in depth into in that uh, in a minute. Um, for those of our listeners here who have now heard for the third time about our previous interview and have not heard it, I just might want to mention that it is season five, episode nine. So if you want to go back on the website, you'll find, of course, that interview. And you might want to do that because it's it's really you just mentioned your use, your background, and it's all being talked about there. We're not going to repeat that uh, here today, so it might be worth going there, really. Fiction, non-fiction, before we go into detail into left hand pass and, and the content of what, what we just talked about, um, being a fiction writer, did you first... Were you first a fiction writer and became a nonfiction writer? Would you say it like that? Or was it always both within you, didn't express itself? Or how did it feel for you? Well, I think a little bit of both. Um, in terms of public publication wise, I was definitely a fiction writer first mm. for, for many years. Um, but of course, like many people do, I, I, I kept a, uh, a journal of, of my own experiences. I, I still, to this day, you know, keep a dream journal uh, beside my bed and, you know, would, would write um, non-fictional work there. But it was it was more of a, a highly personal type of type yeah. of writing. Um, it didn't really um, become published until I began to write essays for uh, Starfire. The, the journal for the Typhonian order that as edited by Michael Staley. Right. And so that those were really, I think, the first esoteric writings that made it public. And I've had essays elsewhere in, in different journals and things like that. When approximately um, would that have been year wise? Oh, uh, I think the first one actually goes back to probably I'm going to say 2005, 2006. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. And then in the subsequent years after that, um, and it was probably partly a matter of gaining confidence, but also really wanting to ensure that if I was going to write something in this vast field of esotericism, which of course covers so many grounds, and of course the terminologies can be so loaded and, you know, different terms mean different things to different people. Um, I wanted to ensure that if I was going to write something that it felt, it felt, um, unique in some way, you know, even if it was just my own impressions or offering a vantage that was maybe looking at, uh, in the case of the Starfire essays, maybe looking at some of, uh, Kenneth Grant's writings from a different perspective than I had seen in, in other, um, either criticisms or, or, you know, essays on his work. Mm -hmm. And then from there, it was just, uh, it, it began to slowly dovetail to where I, I, gained more confidence, but I would say really the benighted path was the, the kind yeah. of breakthrough work where I was able to articulate something and, you know, very fortunately have it strike a chord in, in readers, which is, you know, which is really always a, a rewarding part of publishing. Was it, I say was, I don't say has it been, I say was it because it's the past. That's what we learn when we learn English at school. <laughs> um, was it um, dangerous for you at the time 
as a fiction writer, rather well-known fiction writer, to enter that other subject? You know, whether it was objectively true, uh, I don't know. I will say that, yes, subjectively, it, I, I did have some some reservations about it um, mm. simply because, you know, I know that there are a lot of people who will read about um, strange and 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 dark things or, or, you know, those, those types of uncanny experiences. But for them, it is, it is strictly at an entertainment level or is, is strictly as, as a kind of diversion from their daily life. Which is um, okay. That's, yeah, which is abs absolutely. Yeah. And one of the things I always say is that having, you know, having produced both fiction and the esotericism, the reader is free to, to swim to the depth that they are comfortable doing. And if yeah. people want to, you know, take the story strictly as entertainment, that's absolutely, you know, a valid way to to interact with it. Sure. Um, but I also felt that, you know, there there was there was an area that within myself that I wanted to convey and express. And I wasn't sure how that was going to be received by, you know, the fiction reading community. I thought, well, mm -hmm. is is this really going to, you know, damage my my. Uh, reputation in any way? Are they going to view my stories differently? Um, and for, but for the most part, I think it was actually been to, to my pleasant surprise, like quite well received, even if people, you yeah. know, may not read the esotericism or really even particularly have an interest in it. I, they've been like interested. They've they've you know, they found it um, to be in, intriguing at the very least that, you know, I have interests that run deeper than simply um, utilizing these kind of symbols for for effect in in fiction but also see them as as part of a, a, a kind of spiritual experience of the world it could also be a kind of legitimation for the fiction writer it could sure. be seen as such right right absolutely because yeah. i mean when you really if you really think about it um all the arts derived from magic and and religion and you know mystical experiences they mm -hmm. whether it's drama whether it's music i mean they all have their roots in the sacred mm -hmm. um so it's really not that much of a, a an incredible leap to go from one and explore the other i just think that part of it is is modern times and and you know the cultures that 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 we live in that it is it's less um it's less common than it once was you know in in antiquity where it was but really those are the roots of it and and in my view as well even people who are attracted to let's say the that type of fiction on an aesthetic level i think because of the themes that supernatural horror deals with and the imagery that it employs and the, that kind of visceral emotional effect, it's still being it's, it is still an interaction for those readers on on that kind of mystical level, even if they choose not to put it in that context. Mm -hmm. So that's the kind of interesting um, par paradox of it is that um, even when it is entertainment, it's never just entertainment. In my view, I think it's always yeah. it's always a more profound experience. And you mean that to be true, not just for the kind of fiction that you write but for fiction in general when you when we talk about writing as art or i mean music and other uh, art types yeah, are and, different and, and, but it's the yeah, same thing for sure and i think in a sense you know in a sense they they always kind of capture a moment in time and space they convey mm. um things that you know in an in an encounter that may lurk beneath the surface that we don't acknowledge when it happens in our physical life but in the imaginal life it it can be dealt with but i do think that um horror fiction or weird fiction, supernatural fiction is, is g uniquely um, designed to convey that type of world experience that is so integral to the human condition and that most modern, you know, most modern individuals just, just do not want to face, whether that's, you know, with death or with the irrational or mm -hmm. with watching, you know, watching the civilization kind of reveal how fragile it actually is. These are all really important and, in my view, initiatory experiences that that everyone faces. It's not just people who have an interest in uh, ceremonial magic or or in philosophy. It's faced by everyone, and it it's an integral part of our existence. and And I think that that's why it's so important to you know, to have those, those types of, to engage with that on some level.
Um, I think mm-hmm. it's actually extraordinarily healthy and, and crucial. Absolutely. I think we just made a step in direction of the question that I was going to ask you next now. Sure. And you said different terms mean different things to different people. You just said before, and that's yes. very true. And um, I always like in this show to ask people who have the knowledge to do that and um, to give their definition of certain very common terms, right? Because mm-hmm. um, those terms seem common, but uh, are interpreted very differently by different individuals. Absolutely. And one of those terms is crucial, central even to that, to your works, to your, your whole thinking that's left hand pass, the term, you know, the term left hand pass. So mm-hmm. would you want to give us here your definition of how you would define what the left hand pass actually is? Yeah, ab- absolutely. And again, you know, this will be my my own perceptions sure. of it and definitions that 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 come from you know many years of working within this type of current. And I think for myself, although it is a very uh, broad term that is used widely throughout you know the the occult world as well as you know in 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 fiction and other places, for myself, I. I spent a long time really kind of tracing the origins of of this current, which of course goes back to to India with the Vama Marg. Yeah, and and with with that, uh, there are there are key elements that I think illuminate what that path is underneath any sort of particularized form that it may take in the modern world. Um, the first one, one of the fr- fundamental ones, is that it does put a tremendous focus on the feminine. Mm -hmm. That is, that is one of the uh, key, key points that runs through Tantra. And that I think continues through a lot of the, even the Western versions of, of the left hand path. And that is, if I may say often Mm -hmm. forgotten about. Indeed. Uh, indeed, uh, I, it's really pointed agree. out. It's often not seen as uh, in the foreground, uh, but it is. Absolutely. And, and, and yet mm. it, the, 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 the feminine power and the, uh, and the notion of the feminine as being, you know, the very source of, of this form of, of unique energy. Um, and it's also, it deals a lot with the transgression, not necessarily of, of cultural mores, although in, you know, in ancient times in India, that was very much the case, Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, for instance, in a, in a, uh, the Hindu faith, which is predominantly, you know, vegetarian, they would, they would engage in meat eating and alcohol consumption and things like that. Um, so this, there is that element that was a societal transgression. And I think, you know, to, to it's a lesser degree, you can see that as, as still being, um, extant today in the West. Um, but beyond that, it's also at it, at its fundamental core, the transgression of personal boundaries and and mm-hmm. personal um, certainties. So it's really um, moving into that kind of that darker path, which does not necessarily mean you know malevolence or anything like that. What to me, it is basically the acceptance and the engagement with and the re- and the uh, reverence for that transitional transitory darkness that eclipses certainties that, that, um, obscures boundaries. And when you, when you enter that kind of liminal state, which I refer to in, in the infernal mask as, as demonic reality, Mm -hmm. you suddenly begin to have that, that visceral experience, which again, to add another point to this, this left-hand path definition, that is so important embodiment and the, the body itself, mm-hmm. um, as opposed to a kind of transcendentalist, um, view of an idealized state to which one must move the, the, you know, the sinister current or the left-hand path would definitely be more about embodying that and experiencing it viscerally and realizing that the body is that nexus point that this this world itself is the nexus point between life and death where the, where the spirits of the dead can interact with the living and vice versa um and so that requires cultivation uh, and and a testing of oneself um and i say 
in various writings, and I know early on in the Infernal Mask, I, I do make explicit mention of, yes, it is a trying and difficult uh, path. I think one of the great um, errors that is made by many people who, who approach initiation mm-hmm. is this idea that it is a form of simply being self-improvement or a form of, of uh, gratifying wants or uh, just getting a, a kind of blissful emotional state. It can offer those things, but ultimately, I mean, there are, it cannot be a replacement for therapy. It cannot, you know, it cannot perfect those things that you will not address. Um, those things are going to fester. And I think that's where initiation can be dangerous. I mean, everyone gets tested by it, but really it's, it cannot be viewed as something that will be, um, a catch all for, to fix every issue in your life. That's, that's just simply not the role in or my view commodity, yeah, exactly. or commodity. Yeah. Exactly. I mean, how many, how many people are, are attracted to things like ceremonial magic thinking that it's just another way, uh, you know, a slightly, uh, mysterious way for them to try and get what they want materially. You know, whether exactly. it's money, whether it's a sexual partner, whether, you know, this is, this is rampant and, or, and that's mindfulness really, at a higher level. Right? <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, with that, it's to me, that's, that's uh, a paltry form. And I think also as well, it's, it's that concept of assuming that it is going to provide a kind of um, bubble that's going to protect you from, from the real world, which is just mm-hmm. simply not the case for any, for any I don't believe any spiritual tradition has that. Um, or if it is, you know, if it does have that, I think it's being probably uh, misconstrued by the individual because it really, it's, it's not meant to uh, protect you or to create a kind of alternate reality. I think it's really, if you have that earnest desire, it's to, you want to experience deeply the reality. You, you know, you yeah. want that veil lifted so that you can have that deeper experience, which again, goes back to that uh, notion of, breaking boundaries and, and you lose that, that certitude and those certainties, you know, that's, that is what one of the main things that gets sacrificed, um, as you further engage with just the mystery of being is that, you know, locking it down is, is something that cannot be, um, maintained endlessly. It, it, you know, eventually that your construct will be shattered and probably, you know, by your own hand, even if it's unwittingly, um, just by pursuing it and attempting to, you know, further become. Does it not also partly need to be shattered at first? I, yes, absolutely. And I think that is, that is not only at first, I think it's an ongoing process Mm -hmm. um, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. to, to where you have to understand that you cannot, you cannot undertake initiation as a, as a means to serve the egoic self, the I, the, you know, with its wants and its, its shortcomings, um, that has to be transgressed. And, and that is really one of the, the key points that, that does make this, this form or these forms of initiation, you know, rather traumatic and trying. Not everyone mm-hmm. is, is willing to, to make that sacrifice because it, it, you know, it does not, it does not offer those comforting illusions. If anything, it, it you know, it, it puts them to the fire and right. that which is a falsity is burned away and that which remains is, is tempered and essential. You just said, um, initiation does not want to create an alternate reality, alternative reality, but rather, um, to make the reality more clear, more present, more, uh, ambitious in a way also, right? Mm-hmm, um, absolutely. That I would say is true for the left hand path, like for ceremonial magic, or well, let's call it the right hand path. It's a strange word to use, but we know what is meant by that. But maybe it's easier to falsely escape into some alternate reality when you do the right hand path and then to take up the challenge of the left hand pass. Now, always speaking about taking it seriously and not doing something just on the surface, right? Sure, absolutely. And, and I would, I would agree with you. And I think part of the, uh, the issue with that is that there, you know, these kinds of transcendentalist um, alternatives, whether it's, you know, at some point I will be able to 
leave this gross material plane behind and I will be a, a being of pure spirit. Well, there, there is a certain seductive quality to that. Mm. However, it, I think it becomes so abstract and, and pulls the psyche so far away from, you know, the immediacy of the environment. Um, that, that is why, uh, in, in the new book, the focus is so firmly planted in, you know, the thonic, in the in the yes. infernal in that whole concept of the earth in the earth because mm-hmm. it's really about deepening the experience here rather than viewing it as um you know something that just simply has to be gotten through on your way to somewhere somewhere better somewhere more refined right. and i know that that right. is a seductive um idea for a lot of people but i i don't know i actually don't know how accurate i believe that it is i think it's i think it basically uh, I, and i don't away. think it is the the aim of the other of the other path either i don't it is seductive and that's what i meant you mm-hmm. can be deterred very easily from yes. the actual problematic parts of it because you can always have that hope for uh, sure. whatever transcendence um but um i don't think that's the aim of uh, of that either. Uh, uh, but anyway, we're not going to have a discussion about the past. It's just fascinating to, to, to hear you mm, talk sure. about, uh, about that. Um, embodiment, um, infernal, um, those words stay with many people, even people who are quite literate in the world of the occult. Those words often have that very I don't want to use the word dark because of course it's meant to be dark, but that um, danger, the dangerous aspect to it infernally, we middle think of Satan and we think of all, all that's bad and everything. Um, um, but that's not what is meant by it. Maybe we should clarify that a bit, shouldn't we? Sure. Uh, yeah. And I'm, I'm happy to do that because again, um, the images weren't presented in a, in a kind of contrarian of, oh, well, if, you know, if, if they are about the light, this is about the dark. It's mm. it's really not that kind of simplistic no, binary exactly. dualist mm. view. Um, in in my experience and in and in my own worldview, I believe that in order to engage with this demonic reality, which is a kind of ensouled reality um, that does manifest within those darker more liminal states in a kind of imaginal sense um as well as well as working with with spirits and so forth the the more monstrous or or infernal or other or uncanny these images are the more it shocks people out of a kind of humanistic Mm -hmm. worldview and opens them up to the to a reality that is much richer and also more dangerous and and yet very immediate it's beyond their own perceptions of how they think the world should work or does work um it is sensing that there is this more to it and the reason why i think as I said at the beginning of the interview that in my view, you know, that the sacred has both the beauty and the, the terror inextricably linked is we have become so dependent on logic and, and I believe the, the ego and a certain way of perceiving the world that there's a chasm between this demonic reality or this ensouled reality and the day-to-day life that most of us lead. I mean, we, we, most of us live in cities with, you know, artificial light and climate control. And, you know, we're not even fully aware at times of where mm-hmm. we actually are. Whereas with you know, wild spaces and with forlorn spaces, that is where you suddenly get that very palpable, visceral reminder that, you know, you are, you're on this planet and you are here and that, your experiences of the numinous will occur here in 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 the flesh in in now and that goes to a kind of cyclical mm-hmm. way of time reckoning where you understand that that death is not the final point at the end of a linear uh trajectory where it begins with birth and ends with death that it is they are constantly 
cycling back, which goes into the, you know, notions of the ancestors and of working with the dead, as well as the, you know, the way that we can interact with them. Um, and so those are always going to be by their very nature, very other to us. They're, they're, they will come with that inherent shock, that sense of whether it's the monstrous or the infernal or simply otherness, um, because we require, you know, if we wish to engage on this path, to engage with this demonic reality, we have to lose that certainty. You know, we have to be shocked out of it in order to realize that we are now beyond what we thought uh, you know, just beyond the, uh, what we believed our, our Ken was in terms of uh, perceiving the world. And that gets into that. It's a, it's a kind of delicate state in a, in a lot of respects because it's, it's perceiving things that were otherwise so subtle you may not mm-hmm. even have noticed them before. But in that kind of receptive liminal state, they have an effect on you. You know, you can interact with them. You have, you know, you're having this genuine engagement with with the perennial mystery, which is rooted in life and death and, you know, and, and rooted in a lot of the underlying truths that, that really going all the way back to the ancient origins of humanity, we have been fascinated by and, and, and impacted by. No, I, I have really two very different questions here. I wonder which one I take first. Um, you, you were saying you realize when you are on that path that all of this is not only a humanistic question, right? Um, yes. Meaning is not only concerning human beings. So could we also say it's not exactly. only anthropocentric, right? Um, um, Indeed. Yeah, that's a great that way mean, of putting it. Does that what is not human? Does that mean it's nature, it's animals, it's it's whatever? It is the, the other parts of nature then are not human, or does it mean it's other entities like spirits, um, um, demons, whatever you would like to call them? Yeah, I think in you know to a to a lesser degree, you can see it within you know the the animal kingdom, and and of course mm-hmm. the use of of animal totems and animal familiars is global right. and and ancient. Um, so that's that's certainly part of it. Is and and as well as you know, there's uh, plant lore and and tree lore. There's there's a, a great rich tradition of various ways that people have interacted with the non-human world through mm-hmm. nature that is outside of civilization. That's certainly part of it, as is um, things that, you know, spirits and, and you know, the demonic entities, which are really, if you go back to the origins of that term, um, which I discuss in, in the early chapters of the new book, yes. is that it is essentially a, a, they were liminal beings. We were, you know, they were no, demons were not gods. They, you know, they were not humans. They were almost intermediary. They, they occupied that liminal space. That was, you know, not the Empyrean realm and it was not fully the earthly realm, but they could interact with both, you know, very much in a hermetic sense. Hermes being a similar form of yeah. being, which, of course, is uh, an immense figure in, in, you know, in mystery traditions and in esoteric traditions. So, you know, with that is the recognition that these things are are connecting with us as non-human as they may be. That is because in my view, the initiate realizes that there is also a kind of non-human, if you will, uh, quality to their own being where outside of the, the intellect and the way that we perceive ourselves and, and the way that we interact, there is also other, um, there's another element or elements, you know, set of elements Mm -hmm. that, has a form of recognition with that. Now it could well be that, you know, maybe these things are rooted in the mystery of death itself. And we have that awareness of our own mortality at, from a very early age. And perhaps that's part of it. Um, you know, I'm, I'm loath to kind of give a, a concrete answer for it only because as I said, the, you know, the, the if there's one thing I'm certain of is that I, I never wish to be certain <laughs> so, um, you know, that's, I, I, I'm loath to offer, I think there are examples of it in, you know, instinctually it does feel like there, it, there has to be something about us that has this resonance with, 
with these images. And this has been verified. You know, I've gotten some wonderful, you know, feedback from readers over the years who, who have said that they've felt this as well. Um, you know, the way that I, I present this imagery and the, the philosophy behind it has has really to them been um, an articulation of something that they themselves have felt. And I think that that's that's a wonderful thing that really does connect this to the fact that it it is an experience that is not as rare as as we may wish to believe it is or just assume that it may be. I think there are a number of people from various walks of life who have had these inklings or these intuitions and, and you know, have had these kinds of impressions of the world. Um, and I think it's just recognizing that, you know, we're not necessarily at the center of things, that it is, uh, you know, we, we cannot get locked, too locked in these kinds of certainties and that, you know, moving into that kind of deeper reality is a crucial thing to do while, while we are here. Cause again, I believe that this is the nexus point between the spiritual and, and the physical. Okay. That was a long first part and 35 minutes are still to come. A really great interview here today. So let's take that musical break that I promised. And, uh, well, the second title, the second title of Cryo Chamber that we bring here today is called, well, another really dark title, The Faceless Bringers of Pain. No, The Faceless Bringers of Pain, right. <laughs> Sorry, yes, of course, The Faceless Bringers of Pain. And, um, well, after that, we will return to Richard Gavin and listen to the second part of our talk. And when we then are finished, there will be the third track, and that is called The Slow March of Extinction. Well, let's not hope so. Okay, um, well, yes, uh, why should I keep you any longer? No, let me just repeat that. Now, the faceless bringers of pain, then we return to Richard Gavin and the interview. After that, The Slow March of Extinction, both tracks by Cryo Chamber. And, of course, after that, I'll return to let you know who will be my guest next week. Now, enjoy the faceless springers of pain.
I don't want to pull you into anything like occult activism or so, because that's not what, what you are talking about. I'm aware of that. But um, what you just said, is that not also part part of a recipe of the survival of the humankind in a situation where uh, the world stands with all those, say, resource crises? Let's put it that way. I think it's not just climate crisis. It's resource crisis. That's, you know what, that's a really interesting point. I'd never actually put it in that context, but I do see how you reach that conclusion. And yeah, I mean, I think that there's, you know, that's, that's a valid perception of this. I think mm -hmm. that, you know, as we, we've gotten further away from this mode of interacting with the world, and I think to our detriment, you know, yeah. and this is not, this is not, um, as I often have to say as a kind of qualifier, this is not anti-technology or trying yeah, to get sure. us to go back it's you know in a kind of rousseau version of where we're going to go back to the noble savage that is you know not at all yeah. what i'm suggesting no, 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 however um you know we have started to to realize that um there's there's a great loss in the creation of this kind of superficial reality i mean people you know, they live through social media. They, they are, you know, it's, it's these mirages that, that have become so prevalent in, in daily life that a lot of the inevitabilities of life, such, such as death and hardship and trauma and, you know, the realizing that we are not at the center of things, that we do not, that, you know, reality does not always conform to our will. You know, your your fate is is a kind of force that, yes, you can influence, but at the same time, it is going to throw curveballs at you. You are going to suddenly be faced with uh, crisis and trauma and things that are going to create massive upheaval in your life. Mm -hmm. And there's beauty in that. There really is. There's 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 personal yeah. empowerment in that. There's there's wisdom to be gleaned from that. Um, you know, whether, whether it's all preparation for death, I don't think I would necessarily simplify it to that degree, but I think it's important that people really have those kinds of, uh, reminders, um, and, and yeah. engage with it. And again, going back to what we were saying earlier about fiction, I mean, that's, that's a great starting point is to read. And if you're perceiving it strictly as a kind of strange entertainment, um, that's great. But at a certain point, many of those, the principles and themes and motifs that are in a lot of horror stories are things that will be met by people along the way. Um, and without, without that kind of experiential pool of knowledge, you're really going to be left adrift. And in my view, I think that, um, this also applies to the spiritual realm itself, to, to that moment when we do die. I'm not of the opinion that suddenly, you know, when your heart stops beating, that that's it. And the, 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 the actual individual that you were, yes, that will cease. You know, you are, you know, we are all kind of unique expressions yeah. uh, for the time that we are incarnate. However, mm -hmm. um, I also feel, I mean, that there's, there is great importance and, and almost urgency um, in, in contemplating and exploring, well, what will happen potentially after the, you know, the, the moments after I die, will I be prepared? I mean, we, you know, looking at ancient Egypt or ancient Greece, I mean, these cultures would spend, you know, their money, their time, their a great deal of their mental energy on preparation for what they viewed as being the, you know, the afterworld. And I think that there's a lot of, um, that's a that's a that's a worthwhile endeavor because it is the inescapable um inevitable point that we will all reach and i think without you know without any sort of preparation or contemplation or just operating on the presumption that well it doesn't really matter i'll just i'll be here now and then when i die it's i'm just going to be erased so it doesn't you know mm -hmm. nothing matters um, that's not a gamble I'm willing to take. It's on, a, on, a, on, an, on an irrational kind of, um, I'm not sure why, but just instinctually that just, that doesn't feel correct to me. Feels that wrong. feels yeah, it, yeah, a little yeah. bit like a, a kind of, uh, 
wish. And I remember I was recently I was reading an essay by Robert Thurman about the Tibetan Book of the Dead. Mm -hmm. And he was saying that it, he, he found it interesting that this this notion of physical death being a complete erasure um, is essentially a, a myth that has really taken hold in modern times. Because he said, if you look at thousands of years of accounts from all over the world in every culture, in every era, there is a tremendous amount of evidence of, of spirits and transition from life to death and that. Um, there is, you know, forms of, of being that do continue. And so, yeah, I think it's, it's a very important area to explore while we're alive. Uh, the drama is that we only know about death because we are alive. <laughs> exactly. Right. And again, that's, that's, that is part and parcel of the whole paradoxical nature yeah. of being really. And that's, Absolutely. that's, that's the thing. I mean, that is really what creates that, that frisson is that it's not mm -hmm. about, you know, engaging with, with these kinds of eternal mysteries, which are living things that with, with which we participate, um, that kind of engagement is, you know, it's, it's really a, a crucial thing. And it is also, um, lost my train of thought there but basically yes it's a, it's a crucial a aspect that is a paradox that is not meant to be resolved right you know it cannot be resolved i think you know th this was the point i was going to make was that you know the it is not like you gather the clues and then you you solve the great mystery of being and then suddenly everything in your life is fixed and you're completely pr that's simply not realistic right right uh, the paradox is there to be paradoxical It is there um, to to challenge. It is there to, you know, when you have it conceptualized and understood, it will change its mask and it will take on a completely other form and will throw you, as I said, that that kind of curveball where suddenly you're the path you were on veers in a completely unexpected direction. Um, and that is that is its its nature. I believe that is the nature of being yeah. is that it is yeah. um, it is that immersion. It is that that liminal uh dark way as well as along with all of the other things like like logic and and you know and utilizing technology and getting along in the in the day-to-day -day world i mean that's that is absolutely crucial my my argument is not against that it is mm -hmm. against adopting that as the exclusive mode of uh, the the exclusive arbiter yeah. of reality yeah 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 talking about exclusive and I have the impression that when you speak about the daemon uh, in your book or also now when we speak about it, you use it in the, the classical way, so to speak, about the, the spirit, the more or less dark spirit uh, from the dark sides. And there is also a usage of the word daemon, which has been more present recently in the occult world by people like Frater Acker or even Anthony Peak or people like that, um, mm -hmm. of the daemon being the literal translation of the Latin word genius, the, that yeah. what makes the soul of the human being um, um, alive, so to speak, and what, or special or particular. Um, yes, and I, um, I, I would concur. I, I would absolutely. Uh, I was going to say when when I hear you speak, I have the impression that those two concepts of the word daemon are not opposites, but they are complementary. I I would think so. And, you know, in my experience, I think that's true. And I think going back to what I was saying about the fact that when we encounter this otherness and this paradoxical, you know, mystery, there is a part of us that is invigorated by that and and recognizes that. Mm -hmm. And I think that that is the, the fact that we are to use one of David Beth's terms that I very much like is the individual is a kind of unique demonic event. It's mm -hmm. a, it's a confluence of all kinds of different factors, uh, both, you know, genetics and, and, you know, perhaps past lives or, uh, affinities and that will not occur again. And what is fantastic about it is that I do believe that there is a, a G an inner genius or daemon that is inherent in, in all, all living things. And that it is something that you can recognize that will often shock the system, but it is really that, that, um, 
component that allows that it allowed that is what allows us in my view to engage in initiatory endeavors right you know it is it's because it we have that uh whether it's you know a, a genius or a capacity or a um some form of you know for lack of a better term a power that enables us to have those types of experiences and to recognize on an intuitive level when something has on a rational level it may not it may not chime with how we viewed the world. Mm-hmm. However, on a, on a deeper level, there's, there's something to it. Um, yeah. So I think it, it's definitely part of, and this is why imagery of the depths and the netherworld, uh, you know, the earth and the earth mm-hmm. is so important to the, to the infernal mask and to all of my work really. Absolutely. Um, because it's, it's, it's less about, um, the creation or the aspirational move towards an imagined or created um, idealized vision of anything, including the self or the world or both. It's more about experiencing it on that deep level, even when those depths are distressing, Um, Mm -hmm. you know, and, and that's, you know, in my, in my view, that is, I believe that we are, there's a quote that I've always loved. It's by the poet, W. H. Auden, and he mm. once said, "We are lived by powers we pretend to understand." Mm. And I love that quote because it really does emphasize the fact that most of the things that we that motivate us, most of the things that you know, and this this doesn't even necessarily have to be restricted to mysticism or to mm. esotericism. I was going to say this is very yeah. much material approach as well. Sure, so that's I, what I, happens you know, every day nowadays when you think you control your environment, but you don't. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and, and, yeah. you know, there's, the, and even, uh, psychologists would often say, you know, people yeah. are motivated by, by, uh, subconscious factors that they may not be fully aware of. So to me, that is not only accepting that, but actually cultivating and, and working with that, um, as a way of being is, has always been the, that's the drive of my work. Mm-hmm. And that's, why the work is presented as it is. I believe that that is its nature. I try to do, I try to make it evocative and, and to present it in a way that is going to, um, engage the reader. But at the same time, I also try to put myself out of the equation. You know, I, I really try to present it, um, as, as purely as I possibly can. Um, Mm -hmm. and I think that, you know, the, judging by the reactions of a lot of readers who have said that, you know, they had perhaps been pursuing other spiritual paths through their life or had, you know, certain philosophical inclinations through their life. But then when they encountered uh, these works, it was more of an, oh yes, actually, this is what I, (laughs) this is more of what, what I was on about than, than these other things. So that's, that's a great, you know, I feel that that's, that's a hugely gratifying. Absolutely. uh, I, I personally, I, I, admit uh, i have to tell that story briefly and um, actually the first time you and i had personal contact was when we met on greg kaminsky's podcast so called personality right. and he and uh, me as his co-host were interviewing you and you were very, that was the time when the benighted path had just come out mm-hmm. uh, and you were very surprised when we asked you for the interview that we were not going to talk about the benighted path but about your fictional work that you had released right. also around the same time that's right Right. And so the United Pass, unfortunately, I must say, I have never actually read it personally. I only know the second party, Infernal Mask. So when I speak about that, I might be a bit um, not precise enough. But um, when you when you talk about the daemon like you define it, would you see that part, the daemon being an individual part of being or is it the individual's part of what Jung would maybe call the collective consciousness? In my, I would think it's, in my view, I think it's, it is more of a highly individual right. um, being. How That being said, I think that where one may be led by this, you know, by this genius, if we want to use mm-hmm. that term, um, could definitely be something more of what is outside oneself or at least is something that one may engage with uniquely, but it is not, you know, it is not a byproduct of, of the mind. You know, I'm, I've always been, 
very uh, skeptical about that that whole view of well, what I perceive is, is I make that real and, you know, I, yeah. I determine I'm the arbiter of reality. Well, you know, on certain things, maybe, but I think that that's, that's yeah. kind of a very shallow way to exist. So for me, it's, I've always been much more interested in, in engaging with, you know, that which, pro, you know, provides that kind of frisson, that kind of, even if, even if it is the, a bit of a, um, an agitation because it's it to me it's it that is a much more direct experience of of the real than simply saying well i'm going to think of how i want reality to be and it's just going to conform and i'm going to create a controlled environment where you yeah. know it's it's all just going to be a projection of me that has never held any appeal to me i understand yeah absolutely yeah in the infernal mask you say that the infernal mask may be defined as the worldly enactment of initiation as it occurs in the netherworld. Mm -hmm. I, I find that as a quite a astonishing, not in this kind of, hmm, what does it mean? But in a, a very positively surprising <laughs> sentence. <laughs> um, could you, could you maybe uh, say a bit more about that? Certainly. Yeah. Um, what I was basically trying to point to or triangulate with that statement, um, because I always try to be as, as, as clear as I, I can be, even though mm -hmm. the topics themselves may not translate in a, a kind of logical or, or sure. linear form is, is still to try and have that kind of clarity. Um, which is also why early in the book, I make reference to the fact that, you know, this differs from, from the great work of, uh, of alchemy and so forth, yeah, where it's, yeah. you know, the projection of will to perfect the being it's trying to reach that, um, that experience of initiation of this process of spiritual becoming. And by what I mean by, as it occurs in the netherworld is, is kind of a layered statement. So on one hand, it is when one surrenders one's own desire to um, sculpt or tailor an experience to suit their whims. So in other words, meeting, meeting the real on its terms rather than one's own. Um, and then understanding that if from this perspective, time is cyclical rather than linear, And if one has the belief as, as I do that mm -hmm. this, that there are spiritual beings, spirits of, of land, spirits of place that with which we can interact through initiation, through, um, forms of trance and ceremonial magic and scrying and so forth. There's many different avenues. It stands to reason really that If they are, if these beings are willing to interact with us and engage with us through this art, then that art must have some, some relevancy to the, to the netherworld, to the being that is removed, um, if only by degree removed from the phenomenal realm. Mm -hmm. So in other words, if we interact with spirits as the living, then the spirits will interact with us. Therefore, There must be a for the initiation must be on this continuum in some degree. Mm -hmm. There must be a form of whether it is, you know, uh, a spiritual practice or, or just the way things are done when we are no longer incarnate. Um, I, I firmly believe that these things continue, um, that, that spirits are not simply these inert latent things that pop up and then are there to do the bidding of the magician when he you know, has a particular deed that he wants done. You know, I believe that there is, there is an active dynamic spirit realm that is accessible here in the physical realm. Mm -hmm. And because of that, I think that this art of, you know, this kind of darker initiation or this demonic initiation continues and, and must, must in some way have some kind of, of relevance or meaning or import to these spiritual beings, to these beings or to these demonic powers, uh, mm -hmm. th there must be something integral to it. So 
uh, that is really what I mean of, of trying to engage with it at that level of trying to maybe understand and, and learn and understand that from our perspective, it, it's, it's always going to have a, an otherness to it. But at a certain point, there's also these other spiritual beings that do still engage in this art that do appear under certain conditions that will are responsive to whether it's, you know, an offering or a particular patch of, of woodlands or a particular forlorn area. You know, anyone who has had those kinds of experiences knows the, the palpable nature of it. So one of the threads that I tried to pursue through the book, both, you know, in research, in writing and, and also in practice was trying to um, articulate and, and, convey what this art may be like when it continues, when we are no longer incarnate, when we, as I say in the book, when we become the thing that is invoked as opposed to the invoker. <laughs> yeah. I like that one as well. Exactly. The, to imagine that is a very fascinating thing to do actually, to be the invoked. Oh, thank you. Certainly. Yeah, absolutely. I have a personal theory. Um, as the world seems to be in general less and less spiritual um, so we more and more we as as a, as humanity in general more and more base our decisions our working our thinking on the material side of things um so the spiritual world the spirits the demons or everything that we were talking about here are no longer I would say challenged mm. because there is no, there is no, yeah, there is no interaction going on. Yeah. Be yeah. yeah. I think that that's, yeah. That's so definitely. they start to, they might start, that's my theory. I, I, it's really just a thought. Um, they might start to lead their own plans to go along their own because there is no interaction it's like two parallel worlds that have nothing in common and that that's can an be very point. dangerous right yeah um, so what, what, would, what would you say about that i would say yeah i mean i think that that's i had not actually again that's another point that you articulated mm. that's the second time in this interview you've, you've given this really unique framework that i hadn't thought of but i would i would agree with you i think you know and this it could also be if you look at, for instance, the, the you know, the Hindu models of, of the ages hmm. it, in that, we, you know, we are in what is known as the Kali Yuga, that Kali, we are hmm. in the dark age. So it, it which is it a very long to, age indeed. In the it's, a very, yeah, it is a very <laughs> long age that um, shows that, you know, the the level of um, estrangement that that we feel from from the spiritual realm is is so great that you know we don't even recognize it and there's a lot of people yeah. that now just are so we're so divorced from it which i think is also part and parcel of what i've been saying earlier about the fact that the more um infernal or grotesque or shocking um otherness of of these spirits makes perfect sense in that in that notion because they it would they would have to impress upon it. they will only become more removed as you were saying you know if if these are if, if let's say for you know for using this model as as just an example if these two paths have diverged and continue to diverge as the humanistic realm becomes further and further divorced from this as i said in my view very dynamic mm -hmm. um strata of reality if you will the, the yeah. demonic strata yeah. um of course you know they they would be they would become further and further unrecognizable more other their nature which again we're not talking about these kind of dualistic good versus evil no 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 not dark. at all not at all hmm? but the this whole notion of the the lack of of human centric um activity and and ethos in that demonic realm would be an incredible shock to us um hmm. because we we just simply do not have that, you know, that level of interaction for the most part, I think, you know, what we see is when you do encounter someone who has clearly is, has that receptivity and has, you know, perhaps undergone some form of, of, you know, spiritual training, or at least appreciating these, these, these kinds of aspects of being, um, you know, they're, they're, they're very aware of that, of that other, other plane. And it, I, I believe I'm it's sure. just, 
it's right. I do believe that it is right there at all times. You know, it's, it's simply um, a matter of the willingness to engage with it. Definitely. Definitely. One term that you use relatively often in this book and that also can be seen at least in my point of view in very different ways and i'd love you to to give your definition of it is primeval primeval the world primeval it's mm. it's often there primeval gnosis it's also i must also be the united path because i see it even in the in the in the reviews there of all the time so what is primeval in that context to you what does it actually really mean in this context here I would say that the context that I use it in um, is to really um, at, a f at the fundamental level. Um, mm -hmm. For instance, going all the way back to the beginning of the conversation when we were talking about the notion of the left-hand path, yeah. one of the theories as to how the Vama Marga term came about was through sun salutations that were done where they believed that the prana would enter through the left hand and flow out through the right hand and there would be a sort of natural allotment right right and part of the heretical if you will or the or the transgressive aspect of left hand path was the turning towards the source itself um and and not not contenting oneself with with the uh natural quote unquote allotment and i think that that to me is also turning towards that looking at reality without or with as little filters as one possibly can and ex and trying to meet it on its terms understanding that that the primordial is is very much this is very much about an an old an old world that is in many respects has been completely forgotten by modernity And I don't know how many contemporary um, avenues would lead one back to it. I think it has to be really the acceptance and the cultivation and, and activation of other forms of interacting with the world. Um, and I think that for me, the primeval is, is an excellent part of it because it, it really does, in my view, root it to, to the earth. It roots it to this deep, And, and demonically empowered mm -hmm. um, experience of the world that's that's ecstatic, that has, you know, we, we see it in the mystery cults, we saw it in the Dionysian tradition, you know, there's plenty of people that had this kind of ecstatic uh, comprehension of, of the world and an engagement with the world on that level. Um, and I, I think that it's partly to note that the ethos of this work is almost backward looking in a strange way. It's less yeah. about futurism it has nothing to do with the idea of, well, one day we'll just load our consciousness into a computer and that way we'll all be immortal. You know, it, Who it, said it's, that? Yeah. Right? <laughs> it's, it is anathema to that, that mode of world reckoning right. and is, is much more attuned to um, the, a more ancient way of being that is still completely relevant, that is still um, an active dynamic force in the world today yeah. but it it's it's one that in, unless one does turn and sort of see that you know the past is still influencing the present it's still a living force in the present you know the dead are not simply uh, faded memories of from years gone by that there is a, there can be that level of engagement i think that that can lead to a radical shift in in uh, one's worldview and one's world engagement Yeah. And I think that 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 word of primeval is a is a great way to sort of point it back to that kind of fiery source. Mm -hmm. The fiery source. That was a good. That was a good point there. <laughs> um, well, we are heading slowly towards the end of our talk already, I'm afraid. Um, so maybe we could close the, the ring a little bit by getting back to the writer, the writer that you are. And um, thus the knowledge, the experience, the e initiative path that you take as a writer um, has an effect on the poet. I mean, on the poet being the fictional writer, right? Um, does, it, does it influence what you do there, what you write there? Absolutely. It absolutely does. I, I, I'm the type of person that really 
by nature is does not compart compartmentalize their life very right. much. Everything is very much holistic, and the it's it's really down to an intuitive. Certain experiences, I I have a feeling will make a, a great story. Other ones will will be you know leading me on perhaps a more uh, private spiritual path or you know a form of writing that you know is is never to be uh, published. And I think that. You know, they all, all of these, all of these, um, forms of expression have their own merits. Um, you know, a work of fiction that I, that I produce, I never want it to be seen by, by readers as though I'm attempting to give them a reportage. Like this is an absolutely yeah. true account of, you know, everything in here is, is a literal truth. Mm-hmm. No, but what can happen is if it's drawn from, a, a visionary experience or a trance experience or, or a spirit encounter. Um, I can give it a context within a narrative where it will be palpably experienced. Um, and in, in that sense, it will be something where a reader can engage with it on, on a certain level, even if it's through a story. So absolutely they are informed. I, my, you know, my life is really it is one path, um, and I, I I I believe that these do all engage um, with one another and inform one another, and it's it's very much um, a free flowing process. And you know that's that's also part of what really keeps me inspired um, mm-hmm. because I I I never know what the you know next experience will be, what the next work will be. Um, so that in that sense, you know, I, I it definitely feels like a, a blessing to to be able to have these kinds of experiences that can um, manifest in, in various different ways in the world. Great. Um, so that really now brings me to my final question. Um, are there any of those experiences in your writing world, be it fictional or nonfictional, that you would like to know let us know about for the future i mean new stuff that we should be on the lookout for or is that maybe not the moment to do that oh no that's that's fine yeah at the moment i'm working on some new fiction there will hopefully be another uh fiction publication uh announced sometime within the next year um after that there i i think you know it it feels to me that there may be a a third book um to follow with, with okay. the benighted path and the infernal mass there, there may be a third one i don't you know i'm, I'm not quite sure what what that will look like as yet but um well, so tri- trilogies know, are always good on those things. right <laughs> yeah it just it, it has it has a feeling that there, it's not quite complete yet yeah. so there there's going to be more to say in in that regard so okay. yeah there there'll always be you know I'm, I'm constantly juggling various projects and and at work on on various different things so I'm sure in due course, there will be new work announced. Great. Well, thank you, Richard. Uh, it was really great to have you back. And uh, I think we covered quite a bit of ground again this time. Um, thanks a lot for that. And I can only repeat. Um, well, I have to ask you that. Do you think the fact that many of those I mean, the Theon publishing books are particularly beautiful, but many of those left-hand pass publishers, which are doing small, um, sm- uh, s- small numbers of books, do very much object books. Is that because the left-hand pass is more touchy, is more material-based, or is it just a coincidence? Uh, I'm not totally sure. I think that the you know the the way that these the, those types of books are embodied is, is definitely, they do become talismanic and, you know, that's Certainly. perhaps that is, that is definitely part of it is that knowing that, you know, the, the, the cover, the, the tactile sensation of, of the work, the, the, the font, the artwork are yeah. all crucial parts part of, of, it, of, the, of its presentation. Um, so yeah, I'm just, I'm, I'm really feel really fortunate to have had such incredible yeah presentations of, of my writing and the united path has been republished because it was sold out it has it's yes. now in its yep, second it's edition and i think it there is. is even an auric edition coming up as well which there is should yeah. be quite spectacular to be to be here sh- soon thanks richard uh, it's thanks. been an absolute pleasure thank you for having and, me back um, on the show well it was pleasure it was all mine and well let's not this be the last time then 
Sounds good. Okay. Bye now. Bye bye.
The Slow March of Extinction by Cryo Chamber, by Johnny Darko and G.M. Slater, to be precise. And, well, that is the end of today's episode, and I hope you enjoyed it. Thanks to Richard Gavin for being my guest here today and for that lovely talk, for those deep insights and for the great discussion we were able to have. Thanks to all you listeners who are coming here this time or each week. And it's really great to have you with us and to be so close and to have followers here who write to me. Please do not hesitate to do that if you want to. Go on the website, thoughtshermes.com, and find all the details. And, well, also thanks to those of you who support this show once again. And please, those who do not yet do that, please consider doing it. We need it. Thank you so much, everybody. And, well, now I owe you what's going to happen next week. Episode 22 will be with you next week, which will then already be july the 31st the last day of july we are running through the year aren't we and my guest next week will be matthew baker and we are going to talk about his new book and the topic of that new book is non-dual shamanism that's not the title it's a topic and we'll tell you more of course about the title matthew baker and myself and about the content especially because Non-dual shamanism sounds like a contradiction in itself, but you will find out what an interesting topic that is. So come back next week. I am looking forward to have you back next week again on the Thoughts Hermes podcast on July the 31st or any day after that. And uh, for this week, well, just heard the slow march of extinction. No, let's not march there. Let's all be careful of our planet our world more careful than we used to be should we take care stay tuned hear you soon